you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Shout for joy in the Lord, you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre and make music to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. Praise the Lord all the nations. Extol him all the peoples. For he is great and his steadfast love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. And know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's stand together and let's use the moments we have here together this morning to come into the Lord's presence the way he tells us he wants us to come, which is with singing and praise and hearts overflowing with gratitude and shouts of joy. So let's do that together now, church. Let's lift our voices to our good and faithful King and bless his name together. Behold the breaking dawn.
Come into your presence with singing and with gratitude for who you are and for all you've done, God. Be worshipped and adored. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, God. Thank you for your kindness in sending your son to die for us so that we would have hope everlasting. Thank you, God. Thank you for your mercies that are new this very morning towards us. Thank you, God. We love you. We bless your name. 
Would you receive all the praise that you alone are worthy of, God? We pray all this in the matchless and mighty name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So good to worship with you this morning. Before you're seated, why don't you take a moment now to turn and greet someone near you. And as you do, tell them one thing that you are grateful for this morning. Let's do that now. Good morning, fellowship. Uh, Let me introduce myself to you as well. My name is Rob Sweet, and I am grateful for this church. I honestly am. Sounds silly to say it in my role, but I really am. I'm grateful for you all, and I'm grateful to be able to be here together this morning and to be with you this morning. If you're new to fellowship, maybe it's your first time here or one of your first times here, we'd love to connect with you. If you'd like to connect with us, it's up to you, but there is a contact card, the bottom of the program that you received when you came in. You can fill that out. After the service, we have a connect point in our uh, arcade, which is the area right outside the doors there. And uh, hand that in to somebody. We have a gift as a way of saying thanks for visiting and we'd love to get to know you just a little bit better. For everybody that calls fellowship home or guests, don't miss all the, all the announcements that are in the program. We weren't gonna go through all those. We won't go through all those, but we wanna make sure that you're aware that they're there and pay attention to them. And then there's a prayer request part where if you have a way that we can pray for you, fill that out on the bottom of that card and you can turn that in as well and we'll pray for you. In fact, our whole, whole elder team prays for every single request that comes in every time we meet. We meet every other Wednesday night and we pray for all those requests that have come in over a two week period of time. Speaking of our elder team, This morning, we're gonna have the opportunity here to install formally the three men that have been walking through our elder vetting process that you got to know about six weeks ago. And we're excited about that this morning as they've completed that process. Before we do that, however, I wanna give us a chance to thank several other men who will be rolling off the active elder board. These are men that have been serving on the board for a long time. And so about a year ago, we amended our bylaws just a bit to require a break after about six years on the elder board. Um, These men have been serving so well and faithfully, but we just know it's healthy to give them a break. And each of these men have already been serving over double that, believe it or not. A couple of them have been on the board 14 years, I think. One's been on the board 18 years. And these men deserve a well-deserved rest. So we prayed that God would raise up some new elders and he has, and we're gonna have the opportunity to give these men a break as well. So according to the bylaws, whether you're a staff elder or a non-staff or lay elder, and we have a mix of both, gonna have a break after a six year term of service. Uh, So I wanna introduce these men to you and ask them to go ahead and come up on the stage. Bob Elrod with his wife, Mariah. Hunter Murray with his wife, Kristen. Tony Wood with his wife, Terry. And then we've got two that aren't here this morning. Kevin Verdon, his wife, Carol. They're out of town in Washington State visiting family. And uh, the last name, someone you may have heard of, Lloyd Shadrach. His wife, Lisa, they're out of town as well. Now, let me say this about Lloyd. Lloyd's not going anywhere, all right? I don't wanna get the emails, all right? Lloyd's role is not changing. He's still gonna be doing everything he does as Lloyd, you know, the teaching, the shepherding, the leadership of the church, but he won't be for a season a part of the formal elder board, which just means there'll be some fewer fewer meetings that Lloyd will be at. Since our board is a mix of both lay elders and staff elders, we think it's a great practice from time to time to bring in different staff members and different staff roles to have a voice on that elder team. So Lloyd's leadership voice will still be just as strong as a staff member influencing our church and leading alongside me and our other uh, leaders that are on staff. Let me turn my attention though to these three men and and let me just say to, to Tony, to Hunter, to Bob, you all have served well. You have served faithfully. You have served graciously through some amazing times and through some very difficult times and some that were both amazing and difficult. But we wanna thank you for your service. We are very, very grateful. And let me also say to your wives, to Terry, to Kristen, to Mariah, 
You all have served this body in ways that most of these men and women in the room will never know. And we are grateful for your sacrifice and your service as well. Let's show our appreciation to these if we may. You could have a seat. Uh, they'd be the first to tell you all the glory goes to God. And yet it is a good and right thing for us to recognize them and thank them and honor them in this moment. And now I wanna ask any of the other elders that are in the room and the three new elders or the candidates to become elders that we introduced you to, if, if you would all come up on the stage and I'll introduce the, the three uh, incoming elders that we're gonna be installing this morning. John Lowe and his wife, Becky, Jeremy Smith, his wife, Julie, uh, had to go out of town and Steve Watson with his wife, Jenny. So those three men and their wives will be up here front and center. And then back behind them, you have these outgoing elders and then any other elders that we have in the room along with your wives as well are gonna come. In just a minute, we're gonna lay hands on uh, these individuals, these couples, and we're gonna pray for them as we commission them. But before we do that, let me just remind us, these men have been through a very extensive process that's, that's been a, a year for most of them. Or some, I think it's been over a year. And we wanted to get to know them. We wanted to do a lot of prayer and just ask, is God, would you reveal if these are the men that, that you've called to? We introduced them to you and you've been a part of the process in the last month and a half. You've given us feedback and the process has gone very well and we're grateful for that. And so it seems good and right, both to us as a congregation congregation and to the Holy Spirit that God has called these three men to step onto our active elder board. And uh, men, we want to thank you for being willing to serve. And I know you don't even exactly know all that you're getting yourself into, but we want to thank you that you're uh, willing to serve in this way. And I have um, a, kind of a, a commissioning that I want to read to them. These are commitments that they are making today. And I want you to hear them and I want them to hear them. And it's going to give them a chance to verbally respond to these commitments. So let me read this uh, to you, three men, John, Jeremy, and Steve. Having put your faith in Jesus Christ and faithfully serving in many capacities at fellowship over the years, having grown in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus and having now aspired to the office of elder and having been approved and affirmed to that office after careful examination, will you now promise by God's grace and dependence on the Holy Spirit to submit to God's word as your only infallible rule of faith and practice, to take care of your own spiritual health that you may be able to tend to those who need your care and lead a life worthy of emulation that embodies the gospel of Jesus. To be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as elder, shepherding God's flock allotted to you willingly and eagerly and seeking to model first what you ask of them. And do you promise to zealously promote the truths of the gospel and seek the purity and the peace of the church? no matter what comes your way. If you do now set your heart to make this pledge, promising that when you fail, you will seek both forgiveness and restoration as soon as possible, then we call upon you in the presence of God and this congregation to answer, I do. I do. Amen. Uh, we're gonna lay our hands on these individuals and we're gonna invite you just where you're seated, seated right now to bow your heads as we pray for them. Tony Wood, uh, one of our long-term elders who'll be rolling off the active board is gonna lead us in a prayer of commissioning for these. Let us pray. Father, we come to this moment with reverence and with great gratitude. We want you to be glorified in this body. We trust the plan you gave us in your word for churches to be led by a plurality of called and qualified men. We have passionately and prayerfully sought you long, and we believe you have responded. Only you know what the next years hold in store for us, but we believe that these are the men you have raised up and equipped to be part of the season in leading your mission here at Fellowship. We bless you. And we thank you for Jeremy, for John, and for Steve. 
And as a body now, we intercede and ask on their behalf. Would you continue to enlarge within them the heart of a shepherd? Would you meet them in their quiet moments of seeking your will and your way in your word? Would you keep growing within them a passion to see men, women, students, and children come to faith and grow in faith and carry their faith around the world? May they love people well, not just as they think about the body as a whole, but may they have a deep, caring, pastoral love for each and every individual they interact with. Would you continue to grow within them a quiet, peaceful faith, one that can sit in the midst of tension and difficult decisions that need to be made, and at times even conflict, and yet not panic. May they be so confident in your sovereignty, so sure of your great love and faithfulness, so certain about the sufficiency of your word that they will walk in step with you. Would you grant them courage and wisdom as they engage difficult situations? And in this time, we pray for a special grace for their wives, for Julie, for Becky, and for Jenny. There will be burdens that they will carry with their husbands and others when they will prayerfully watch from a distance as their husbands wrestle to know your heart and your mind. Would you guide them with wisdom, with patience, with peace, and with an increasing joy as they see you move here among your people? And finally, Father, we ask that in years to come, as these men look back on their time of service, May they have the incredible blessing of being able to testify with an unshakable confidence that truly Jesus Christ is the shepherd and head of Fellowship Bible Church. May they know that their eyes have seen you do what only you can do. And it's in your mighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 As these men and women leave the stage, uh, just a couple more things that I want to share with you so that we can pray for them. We have three teams that will be leaving fellowship to go serve on short-term mission trips this summer, and we're going to have a chance to pray for them. I want to talk about each of these three teams very briefly, and you'll see their pictures on the slides as well. Uh, we have a team going to Guatemala. This is one of our FSM teams, our Fellowship Student Ministries, so 7th through 12th graders. They'll be doing vacation Bible school uh, for the children in Guatemala. They'll be building kitchen stoves for families who can't afford that. Apart from our help, they'll be sharing the gospel with residents of Santiago through home visits alongside a church plant there. And they depart on June 23rd. And so we'll pray for them in a moment. Secondly, we have a team going to Slovenia. Also part of our fellowship student ministries. Uh, and the team in Slovenia is going to come alongside an organization called Josiah Venture to help host a music camp for teenagers. Uh, in that camp, they're going to use music as a bridge to build relationships with the teens and share the love of Christ with them. And they'll depart on June 26th. And then finally, we have a team going to Peru. And this will be a family trip, be a mix of adults and some students, parents and children largely. Huge variety of activities that they'll be doing. They'll be locking arms with our partner church in Comas, Peru, helping to host the church's first father-daughter dance. We'll be participating in a kids club, a program for single moms, and have a chance to uh, teach at the local seminary. They're going to teach on the theology of the heart, which is something that we've been talking an awful lot about here at Fellowship. So we're going to pray for each of these teams. Um, and then as I pray, I'm also gonna pray for our offering. So we'll pray for these teams, we'll have a chance to give our gifts and then we'll continue with our worship service. So if you'd bow your heads with me as I pray. Father, by your spirit, would you empower these three teams as they go from here to the ends of the earth for your glory, to Guatemala, to Slovenia and to Peru. May they be the hands and feet of Jesus to the men and women, young and old, they will encounter. Would you give them energy and boldness and servant hearts? Would you bind them together in unity, help them stay healthy so they can do your work? Would you help them be spirit dependent as they serve? And would you bring them safely back here, no doubt having been changed by their experience? And now, Father, we gratefully offer our gifts to you in this offering. Would you use them in this church and in our community to help people find wholehearted life in your son, Jesus Christ? 
It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, hey, as the ushers are coming forward for the offering, if you're able to, scoot to the middle of the rows. We've got some individuals back here that are still looking for seats and we could help them out that way. Thanks. Amen. May it be. Three days ago was the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And um, like maybe some of you, I, I got wrapped up in it a little bit. Reading the media articles, I was fascinated by it. I hadn't studied it much, or at least it had been since 11th grade or so since I'd studied it. And I loved reading about that. I mean, it was an amazing day and it was a terrible day, both combined together. And, and what I experienced as I just spent some time reading articles and seeing things and watching documentaries is there's so many ways that you can communicate about an historic event like that. Uh, I saw timelines of the events. I saw illustrated maps, stats and figures about the casualties and the, the number of people and equipment involved. I read some firsthand accounts by survivors, and eyewitnesses now in their 90s. And all that was very interesting. And then I came across a speech uh, that Ronald Reagan gave in 1984 on the 40th anniversary of D-Day. Reagan delivered it from the top of a cliff near Normandy Beach called Point du Hoc. And on D-Day, 40 years prior to Reagan's speech, an army ranger's unit had successfully scaled that very cliff at tremendous cost. They were scaling it to destroy some German guns that they believed were going to wreak havoc on the American troops as they came in on the beaches. More than half of that army ranger's unit were either killed or wounded in the fighting D-Day and the day after. In the audience for Reagan's speech in 1984 were the survivors from that very unit, men who were now in their probably mid to late 60s. And here's what Reagan said in part in his speech. 40 years ago at this moment, the air was dense with smoke and the cries of men and filled with the crack of rifle fire and the roar of cannon. Free nations had fallen. Jews cried out in the camps. Millions cried out for liberation. 
Europe was enslaved and the world prayed for its rescue. And here, the rescue began. Behind me is a memorial that symbolizes the ranger daggers that were thrust into the top of these cliffs. And before me are the men who put them here. These are the boys of Point de Hoc. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. These are the heroes who helped end a war. Strengthened by their courage, heartened by their valor, and born by their memory, let us continue to stand for the ideals for which they lived and died. Now, why is that more moving than maps and charts and timelines? It's because it pushes past all the information and engages the emotions and the desires of the heart. That's what great prose does. That's what poetry does. That's what music does. That's what art in various forms does. And we're going to spend this summer in a book. It's actually a collection of texts that we call Psalms that were written for that very purpose. So two weeks ago, last when I was here, we introduced a short two-week series called Word Centered. And the key idea of that first message that I shared on Word Centered was this, because God's word affects the whole heart, our thoughts, emotions, desires, and choices. We must engage God's word with our whole hearts. And so the question that leaves to be answered is, well, how do we do that, right? And then you know, next week, Rubel Shelley came and did a great job reassuring and sort of talking about the foundation that we have is true. We can be, it's reliable, it can be depended upon. But I wanna come back to that question. How do we engage the word of God with our whole hearts? And I would say, we're gonna take a whole study through the book of Psalms to do that because that's what the Psalms were written for. Now, you tend to think of the book of Psalms as a hymn book, and it is that in a sense, but even more baseline, even more essential than that, it's a prayer book. Psalms is a collection of prayers. Many of those prayers were put to music and became the hymn book or became the psalm book of the ancient Hebrew people. But the best way to think about the Psalms is a collection of conversations between humans and God that engage the whole heart. Like they're all in, you know, if you've ever read those prayers of David all throughout the Psalms, and he was just one of several authors of the Psalms, it's like David was an all in kind of guy. David was all in with his relationship with God. It's interesting that God later would say about him, he was a man after my own heart. Isn't that interesting? Now, any real relationship in your life is gonna engage all of you. If you have a relationship that means something, it's gonna engage you. You can't relate to people meaningfully with just your thoughts and your choices. Your emotions are involved. Your desires are involved. How are relationships developed and expressed? Primarily through conversation, through communication. I wanna say it's the same with your relationship with God. Primarily, it's developed and expressed through conversation. Conversation we call prayer. So our prayers should engage the whole heart. The problem is we don't know how to pray that way. We don't. This is where the Psalms come in. These are the prayers that taught the Hebrew people how to pray. These are the prayers that have taught the people of God how to pray for thousands of years. These are the prayers that will teach us how to relate to God, not just with our minds and our choices, as important as that is, but these are the prayers that are gonna teach us how to relate to God with all that we are, our thoughts, emotions, desires, and choices. Um, just personally, my walk with God really came alive when I started writing out my prayers in a journal. Before that, I think I was mostly trying to relate to God essentially just with my thoughts and, and, and my choices. And, and, and again, that, that's, that's a part of it for sure. But I learned how to relate to God through writing out my prayers. I learned how to relate to him, not just as a mental construct, but as a living being that I was in relationship with. Do you see the difference of that? Now, I think for me, you don't have to write out your prayers, obviously, but I think for me, the reason that that worked is it made the relationship tangible. You know, I, I had a journal that I could look at and read. There was ink on a page and I would just reflect on my life. You know, not, not like a dear diary, but like a God, here's where I am, here's where I'm learning and where are you? Some days sounded like that. Other days it was rich in my relationship with God. Now, I think the same thing is going on in the Psalms as these writers are interacting with God, sometimes struggling with God, but it's all real. It's all very tangible for them. And so the Psalms are gonna give us a vocabulary to relate with God 
relate to God with the whole emotional range that is true of our whole lives. You can't go through life without feeling things and desiring things. I hope you don't. But it's not always easy to relate to God in a wholehearted way. Now, you know what's even more wonderful about the Psalms? Is, is unlike my, my prayer journal, the Psalms are a part of the scripture. You know what that means? That we believe that they were breathed out by God himself. And Rubel talked last week, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. So here's what that means. That not only are these songs, these songs and prayers, the Psalms, not only are they wholehearted expressions of humans to God, but because they're part of our scripture, breathed out by the Holy Spirit, they're wholehearted expressions also of God to humans. Isn't that amazing? I think that's kind of cool. You know, guys are, most of y'all are just kind of staring at me. That's, I think it's really cool. I do. Now, here's what I want to do this morning. I kind of have two purposes in this. Uh, I want to set the whole study up. I've already started that, but I want to, I want to give you a couple more things. Let me look. How do, you, how, how do you get something out of the Psalms? I've had two or three conversations with, with guys in the last week that they're like, yeah, I hear we're studying Psalms. I probably need that because I don't really like them. You know, I don't really get them, you know, and, and uh, that's, that's fine. That's okay. Uh, so I want to give you some keys to understanding the Psalms. And then secondly, we're going to dive into to the very first Psalm, Psalm 1, and spend some time there this morning. So a lot to cover. Uh, I'm going to try to hit some things very briefly if I can. Let, let's take a big look at the, at the Psalms themselves. I've already told you they're fundamentally prayers. They were put to music, so they're songs. But you'll also notice that they're poetic. They're classified as Hebrew poetry. And to really understand Hebrew poetry, you need to know two things, because there's not rhyming in Hebrew poetry. By the way, isn't that good of God that their, their, their primary poetic device was not rhyming? Because we could never translate that into English in a way that would make any sense. But there are two things that characterize Hebrew poetry that you need to know. The first is called parallelism, and the second is imagery. Let's talk about parallelism. And an easier way to think about parallelism is just parallel lines. The, 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 the words tend to have a parallel structure when, when you line up the lines together. And that's why in your text, if you, you know, open your Bibles to Psalm 1, if you haven't already, you're gonna see the way the text is, is written. It's lined up in a parallel format. It's not just a straight paragraph narrative that you might be um, used to seeing. What is parallelism? Here's just a really easy definition. It's an intentional arrangement of two or more lines that interact together around an idea. That's all it is. Intentional arrangement, two or more lines interact together around an idea. Now, often the first line will say something and then the second line will repeat the same idea in the same words. Let me give you an example of this uh, from Psalm 19. We'll put verses one and two from Psalm 19 up on the screen. The heavens declare the glory of God. And look at the second line. I'm gonna say the same thing in different words. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Do you see the parallel, parallelism? The heavens declare, second line, the sky above proclaims. Back half of the line. The glory of God, back half of the second line, his handiwork. They're in parallel. Now look at verse two, same thing. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. When you have two lines that say the same thing, we call those synonymous. So this is what, you don't have to remember all this, synonymous parallelism. And there's a lot of different kinds of parallelism. But here's how I like to think about this. Let me give you an, an, an analogy to help you with this. Uh, I know we got a lot of musicians in the room. And if you're not a musician, you probably like music. You know, you live in Music City. And uh, I used to play trumpet. I still do on occasion. But what this reminds me of is, is, is jazz. In jazz, what you'll do is, is you'll have a, a player that'll, that'll play a line, play a lick. A lot of times it might be improvised. Maybe he'll go like do-do-do-do-do-do on the trumpet. Then you got the saxophone over here and he's gonna oftentimes repeat back the same thing. Do-do-do-do-do-do. And then he'll do a line and he'll do a line and they're kind of trading it back and forth. Think of parallelism that way. It's a lot like that. It'll help this come alive for you. Now there's another kind of parallelism I want you to see called antithetical parallelism. It's where the second line says the opposite or says something different. There's a contrast in the lines. Let's take a look at this from Psalm 1 verse 6. This is from our own text this morning, our own Psalm. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. So the trumpet's like, do 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 And then the sax is like, do 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 <laughs> Thank you. The, fir the, the first service, I just got like the blank, this blank stairs. Okay. <laughs> now I got like, what do I have to do? Bring my trumpet out to you guys? Okay. <laughs> now, that's parallelism. Think about it. Parallel lines. There's all kinds of different. It's not just 
um, those two. There's all kinds of different ones. The best way you can think about this though is look for relationships between the lines. See how they interact together like jazz musicians. Now let's talk about the second thing that characterizes Hebrew poetry. And this will be a lot more familiar with us. It's imagery. So much imagery in the Psalms, metaphors, analogies, comparisons all over. If I asked everybody in the room, what's, what's one Psalm that you've probably heard of or probably know? Most in the room will say Psalm 23. The entire thing's a metaphor. The Lord is my shepherd. And then it takes that metaphor and plays it out. It's like, what would it be like and feel like to be a sheep led by the Lord? That's Psalm 23. Here's another example, Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, God. Oh, it does something down here. It's like, I'm thirsty for you, God. Uh, in the Psalms, you've got all these images. You've, you've got so many more storms, trees, tents, rocks, horns, lions, stars, fruit, all of them used to point to either attributes of God or describe aspects of our relationship with God. I think images like these awaken something in us that's solid and tangible, maybe even earthy sometimes. It's as if the Psalms are reminding us God is real. He's as real as a rock that you can you know, go down to the pond and pick up and hold in your hand. He's as real as the stars that you see in the sky. Maybe he's even more real than those things. Those are two things to pay attention to as we walk through this Psalm today and the Psalms throughout the summer. Pay attention to the way the lines interact together, these, this parallel structure and pay attention to the imagery. You're gonna see both of those in Psalm one. Last thing about the book as a whole and then we'll move to this particular Psalm. As we read and interact with these prayer songs over the next two months, the invitation is for us to enter a deeper relationship with God not just to know more about him, although that's so important, but to know more about him, to actually feel some things toward him because that's how relationships are designed to work, to have some desires in our heart for him or for life, awakened, stirred, and then to make choices that were different because of it. Another way to think about it, we're studying Psalms this summer so that we might join with the prayers of the ancient people, our own prayers. So that songs might spring up in us to pick up where their songs left off. So that we might begin to speak to God with some wholehearted language that gives expression to our own experience with him in 2019. You see, for we are in Christ, the people of God, just as David was, you know, just as the sons of Korah were, or, or Asaph or any of the other authors of the book of Psalms. With all that said, let's now dive into Psalm one and I'm going to read it out loud and then we'll work through it verse by verse. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on the law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all, he does, in all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now you might've noticed uh, this Psalm, interestingly, is not actually a prayer. It's not technically a prayer. It's one of the few Psalms that's not. Uh, that's intentional. It's placed at the beginning of the book of Psalms for a reason. In fact, the way Psalms is outlined in the Bible, and this is true in our English Bibles as well as the Hebrew um, Old Testaments, is the Psalms is the first of the wisdom literature. So Psalm 1 is setting the tone for everything that follows in the Psalms and everything that follows in all the wisdom literature books that follow it. A huge theme in the wisdom literature is this idea of two paths. And what the Hebrew poet would tell you, the, the, the connected to God, is he'd say, look, there's only two ways you can go, ultimately. 
And we talked about this a couple months ago in our study in the book of James, which you know, we called it the wisdom literature of the New Testament. That's what a lot of people think of James. And so the image is of two roads diverging in a wood. We'll put that image back on the screen. You remember we, we read the, the poem by Frost, you know, two roads diverging in a yellow wood. Now we have labels for these as we talked it through, the one on the left, my way, the one on the right, God's way. And, and what the, the Hebrew uh, um, poets are saying is essentially, look, and they're right. There's really only two paths. Now, you know, the my way path, you're gonna have a bunch of ones that are gonna spoke off of that. There's tons of ways that you can go your own way. Are there not? And, and you know, in that culture, there were other gods and other things. But, you know, the, the writers of scripture would say, the other gods aren't actually gods. What you're actually doing is just chasing down your own way. And this is true for everything that you and I pursue apart from God as well. So these are your two choices. And we're going to keep this in mind as we go through this psalm, because this psalm is saying, here are the two paths. Here are the two paths. So let me give you the big idea of Psalm 1 at the very beginning here. Here it is. The truly good life is found in becoming a person nourished and sustained by God's word. That's the big idea. The truly good life, the best life you could have is found in becoming a person nourished and sustained by God's word. In other words, that's how you walk on God's way path is by being nurtured and sustained in God's word. Now, the, the author just could have said that, but it's so much more rich and vivid to say you can either be a tree or you can be chaff. It draws you in. And, and more importantly, it begs the question, which one are you becoming? Because surely you're becoming one or the other. Now that you've seen the big picture, right? The forest, so to speak, let's look at the trees, or should I say the tree? <laughs> let's look at it. Here's what we're gonna do as we break this down verse by verse. We're gonna see three key words, two contrasting images, and one eternal outcome. Like, isn't that convenient? Three, two, one. Three key words, two contrasting images, one eternal outcome. That's a simple way that you can understand this psalm. Let's talk about the three key words. The first word is the first word of the psalm. It's the word blessed. Let's put verse one on the screen if we can. Blessed. Now, the word blessed in our day has become such a flimsy word, such a religious kind of throwaway word. It's like nobody really wants it. Nobody really knows what to do with it. Nobody really engages it that much. In fact, the last time I heard blessed was uh, I was checking out at the Hobby Lobby and the cashier was like, have a blessed day. And you know, what does that actually mean? I, I think it just means have a nice day, but it's said in some Christian code. It's like, have a blessed day, wink, wink. <laughs> and if you're a Christian, you reply back, oh, you have a blessed day too, you know? And I don't, if you're not a Christian, I don't know what you do. You so look at them funny, I don't know. <laughs> Nothing against that, but I wanna bring back to us the fullness of this word in the Hebrew language. Blessed means happy. Blessed means joyful. Blessed means you're filled up inside. You're content. It's the Hebrew word for what everyone wants in life. Everyone, God followers or not, this is what you want. So when it says, blessed is the man, what this Psalm is starting off by saying at the very beginning of the book of Psalms is, here's the way to happiness. Here's the way to joy. Here's the way to contentment. Here's the good life. You're about to hear the key. Now, did you notice the Psalmist first shows us the wrong path? before he shows us the right path. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Uh, interesting parallelism. If you think about it in these four lines, what it's doing is it's creating a progression. That's how these lines are working together. It's creating a progression. So it's a picture of someone who starts out walking and then starts standing and finally ends up sitting. What's that a picture of? It's a picture of how you get stuck. This is how you get stuck in life. So what this verse is telling us is the, the wrong way, the wrong path, the, the my way path, it has an inertia to it. Like it, it progresses this way. It's like a magnet that pulls you in. And at first you're walking and then pretty soon you get pretty comfortable with this path and you start sitting and then after, you know, or start standing rather. And then after a while, it's like, man, this is hard. This life's hard. I'm going to take a break. You're going to sit down and now you're stuck. By the way, the my way path is where you go without even trying. 
Isn't it interesting how that's been reflected so much in our culture in the last 20 years, you know, and you know, have it my way and the I this and the I that. This is the path more traveled. This is the path that sucks your life away and you don't even realize it. And it, it, it brings you in like a black hole. You see, there is an inertia to the wrong path. Now, verse two then goes on to contrast that because it's gonna describe the other path, the path of life. Let's look at that for a minute. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. I wanna pause on that one line. Just leave, the, leave it on the screen if we will. We get our second key word in this line, delight. First key word, blessed. Second key word, delight. What a powerful word. Speaks to the deep desires of your heart begs the question, what do I delight in? Think about a parent delighting in a child. That's this idea here. Think about maybe a, a sports fan del delighting in his favorite team. Think about maybe a, a teenager delighting in a new relationship, someone they just met that they had their eyes on. We all delight in things. We were made to delight in things. I, I hope to be delighting in some Mexican food in a couple of hours from now. <laughs> now, ultimately, delight is not associated often with God, if we're honest. Especially not the law of the Lord. It's what this man delights in. Um, the law is something that we think about respecting, maybe. Think about obeying, maybe. But we don't delight in it. This takes us back to what we talked about two weeks ago. Um, we made this statement, you will never love God's word until you find in it God's presence with you and his life-changing work in you. You'll never love God's word until you find in it God's presence with you and his life-changing work in you because your heart does not long for a text. It doesn't, but you know what it does long for? It longs for a life-giving relationship with your creator and your creator has revealed himself and expressed himself through a text. Do you see the connection? And so the same spirit that breathed out the words through the original authors thousands of years ago, that spirit now indwells you if you've put your faith in Christ. And so that spirit and you is able to have a conversation. You're able to experience the presence of God and the work of God through the spirit as you all interact with the text together. You might think of it this way. You will delight in the law of the Lord to the extent that you delight in the Lord himself. That's hard. It's hard for me. It's true. That's our second key word, delight. The third key word comes in the next line. Let's look at that. On his law, he meditates day and night. Meditate is our next key word. Don't think about uh, Zen meditation or, you know, when you think about meditation in our context, what, what it means in our context today is you empty your mind. So you don't think about anything. That's meditation. No, no, no. That's not the Hebrew conception. That's not the biblical conception of meditation. The, the word meditate actually means to think about something. It's like to take something, in this case, it's something from the law of the Lord, the word of God, and think about it, to, to, to turn it over in your mind again and again. Now there's a connection between delight and meditate. Here's the connection. When you delight in something, you don't have to work hard to think about it. It's what your mind goes to when it's unoccupied. In middle school or high school, did you ever exchange uh, notes or letters with, with somebody that you were interested in, you know, and developed a relationship that way, you know. I, I, you know most of us grew up before there were text messages. And, and I remember writing notes, I mean, as an 11th grader in high school, all right, there was a girl, this first girl I ever had a big crush on. This is way before I met Jody. And we wrote letters back and forth. Now, what do you do with those letters? <laughs> you save them. You fold them up very carefully. You put them in a shoebox. You hide the shoebox from your mom. <laughs> and hopefully sometime before you get married, you throw the shoebox away. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a shoebox and I used to pull those notes out, those letters out, and I used to read them and read them again. And I'd say, what did she mean by that word, by that phrase, by that little smiley face in the margin? You, you, you see? Now, here's the principle 
whatever you delight in, you will meditate on. You don't even have to force yourself to do it. What you delight in, you will meditate on. And what you meditate on becomes the priority of your life. That's the principle. Now here's the question. So what do you meditate on day and night? That's what has your heart. The psalmist is saying the person who has the happiest life, the most full life is the person that delights in the law of the Lord. In other words, delights in God himself and in his self-revelation. And, and honestly, guys, look, if we were to all raise our hands and say, how many of us just consistently delight in the law of the Lord? No hand's gonna go up. We don't tend to delight in it. Maybe rarely, maybe occasionally in our lives. And this is a problem, right? Well, hold that tension. We're gonna talk about that at the end of the message. I wanna move on to verse three. We've talked about three key words, blessed, delight, meditate. Now two contrasting images. And we see the first in verse three. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Such a vivid metaphor. It's the centerpiece of this Psalm. In some ways, it's the launching metaphor for the whole book of Psalms. I want you to see a picture of a tree planted by water, planted by streams of water. If we can get that image on the screen. I just want you to just look at that for a minute as I talk about this. Notice the tree is planted by water in the picture and in the scripture. A tree planted right beside a stream has continual access to its life source. Water's the key to life. There's nothing living without water. Now, what's water representative of in the metaphor in Psalm 1? The law of God. The law of God, the word of God. So here's what the image is communicating. Life flourishes in connection to water. And at the bigger level, the truest level, life flourishes in connection to God himself. And we connect to God himself through his word. You see. Now, if you understand this metaphor, you start to see that Psalm 1 is not a picture of someone who's just really religious. You know, that's how it seems at first. Um, you know, blessed is the man and his delights in the law of the Lord. He meditates on, you know, picture a monk or something. That's not the picture here. It's not a picture of someone really religious. It's a picture of someone fully alive. That's the picture in Psalm 1. It's a picture of human flourishing. And then it goes on, if you could put the verse back up on the screen, it goes on to, to finish this, these, this couplet, this little line here. In all that he does, he prospers. Uh, don't read into that a theology of material prosperity. That's not what that means. Rather, it describes a human being living out his or her full potential. Leaving behind a trail of life and wholeness that touches everyone he or she comes in contact with people and organizations and families and friendships and even businesses are more full of life because that person was there. That's the picture of a tree beside water. Now, let's connect the dots of the progression. What you delight in, you will meditate on. What you meditate on becomes the priority of your life and the priority of your life determines the fullness of life you have and the amount of life you have to give away. The priority of your life determines the fullness of your life you have and the amount of life you have to give away. If you delight in the law of the Lord, you'll become a tree. Now the contrasting image in verse four. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Now this would be a very common metaphor in their day, but we need to explain it just a little bit. Before wheat can be used to make flour, which is so important to food and all cultures, you have to separate the useful part, which is the little grain. It's, it's, it's solid, it's heavier, it's harder. You have to separate that out from all the other stuff, from the outer shell, from, from the, the other stalks and, and everything else. All the leftover stuff is called chaff. 
And so what they would do in ancient times is they would lay out all the wheat on a threshing floor and then they would have the animals come and they would walk all over that wheat and it would pound it and it would kind of disintegrate all of it so that you have the kernel separated out from all the other stuff. And then they had these, these big you know, threshing hooks that they would lift up all the mix and throw it in the air. And everything except for the good kernels was so light that the wind would just blow it away and what you'd have left would be the good stuff. That's the image. What a huge contrast in metaphors. There can be no more opposite of a flourishing tree, you see. Let's put the image of the tree back on the screen if we can. I, I have here in this little, cool little pouch here, some chaff. This is real chaff from wheat. It's all the leftover stuff. Now, beautiful, life-giving tree, worthless, leftover, throwaway chaff. <sighs> Which one are you becoming? This is what Psalm 1 is getting after. Three key words, two contrasting images, now one eternal outcome, verses five and six. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here's the end destination of the two divergent paths. On the one hand, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Now, you know, that, that doesn't sound strong to us necessarily, but in Hebrew, this word know is relational language. You know, it's, it's intimacy. The Lord is intimate, not just with you, the path you're on, but your whole life experience. He knows. And then the contrast is the way of the wicked will perish. Uh, there's no way I could say this any better than Charles Spurgeon did. Spurgeon was a very famous British preacher. Not only shall they perish themselves, but their way shall perish too. The righteous carves his name upon the rock, but the wicked writes his remembrance in the sand. The righteous man plows and furrows the earth and sows a harvest here, which shall never be fully reaped till he enters the enjoyments of eternity. But as for the wicked, he plows the sea. And though there may seem to be a shining trail behind his keel, yet the waves shall pass over it and the place that knew him shall know him no more forever. So let's go back to the big idea of Psalm 1. The truly good life, a life of flourishing and fruitfulness, is found in becoming a person nourished and sustained by God's word. Delight in it, meditate on it, and you will find life through it. Now, how do we respond? What's the so what? I've got just a few minutes left and this is what I want to get into. And, and I told you earlier, there's a problem we have. I want to come back to that problem. And, and in light of that problem, I want to give you something to believe and something to do. Because here's the problem. None of us choose the right path all the time. In fact, if we're honest, usually not. Like, I, I think what's true is I suspect more of us feel like dried out husks this morning than mighty trees beside streams. I just suspect that's true. I know that can be true in my own heart. So what do we do with that? Are we supposed to just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and say, well, I guess I need to start loving God's word. I need to delight in it. I need to study it. I need to meditate on it and then I'll have life. Well, I hope you feel some of that this morning. I hope you feel some inspiration for that this morning. But your problem remains, does it not? So here is something to believe. That in the fullness of time, God himself came to earth and became the man who fulfilled Psalm 1. The man who fully delighted in the law of the Lord, the man who meditated on it day and night, the man who was truly planted as a tree beside streams of water. So what it means to be a Christian, and this is where there's so much hope in our faith, it means to put your trust in that man and be grafted into his tree. And then you see, and only then, you become branches of that tree. And isn't it interesting? This is exactly the analogy that Jesus used in John 15 before he was arrested. He spent some final time with his disciples. Here's what he said, John 15. I'm the vine and you're the branches. Abide in me and you'll bear much fruit. 
And so here's Psalm 1 saying, meditate on the word of God and you'll bear much fruit. And Jesus is saying, stay in me, meditate on me, be with me, abide in me, and you're gonna bear much fruit. So in the fullness of God's revelation, we find that's how you get to human flourishing. It is through Christ. That's what we mean when we talk about wholehearted life. In Jesus. You can't ever separate the wholehearted part from the Jesus part. It means becoming a fully flourishing man or woman, being remade into the image of Christ who was the one true, whole, complete human being who ever lived. That's something to believe. That's something to put your faith in. That's something to put your trust in, no matter where you are this morning, no matter how far apart you are from the image of the tree. Now, what about something to do? You know, are you just to believe? Or are you to believe and do? Is our faith only to be passive or are we to live out active faith? Faith and works together, as we talked about in James. Let's talk about one thing to do in light of that. In Psalm 1, there's only one thing mentioned that the blessed man actually does, only one active verb. Meditates. He meditates. So here's something to do. As a branch of the tree, meditate on the word of God. Don't let that word scare you. It just means think about it, engage it. How do you meditate on God's word? You read it and then you think about it. You interact with it, you see. You engage it, you mull it over in your minds, you contemplate it, you allow the words to stir up things in you and you don't push them down so quick. And you talk to God about what you're reading and what you're experiencing, you see. We're gonna give you an opportunity to do that this morning. Like we're not gonna allow you to leave until you at least had a chance. It's up to you if you engage it or not, but at least had a chance to do some meditating on the word of God that's been expressed and read and, and seen and preached and heard this morning. So here's how we're gonna do this. Um, I'm gonna put five questions on the screen and, and these are great questions for any time you want to meditate on the word of God. So write them down if you want. Take a picture if you want. It will help you in your own study to just read a short passage of scripture and then engage these questions. Um, what is God saying to me through his word today? Am I taking this seriously? If I believed and held to this, how would that change things? What desires or deep longings does this text make me aware of? What might God's invitation be to me in this place? Now we're gonna leave those up on the screen for a few minutes and give you a chance to interact with those questions. You can do that just quietly. You can, you can write down if you're a journaler like I am, it's up to you. you just, just take them home and spend some time with them there. The other thing that'll be going on in these few minutes is the worship team behind me is gonna sing a song over us. And, and, and you know, this team is phenomenally talented, not just music, musically and instrumentally, but, but they're musicians. And, and they've engaged with the psalm as we're hoping that we all will do over the last few weeks. And they've written a song rooted in Psalm 1. And so this song will be sung over us as we meditate. Let's do that together. Father, would you speak to us by your spirit as we meditate on your word? May you plant us by streams of water as we allow your word to stir our hearts. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.
Father, we thank you for the richness of relationship with you. Thank you for the life-giving power of your word. Thank you for the invitation to be with you. Thank you for the expectation that you will transform us. May it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. If we can pray for you this morning, we would love to do that. I'll be down front. There'll be a, another couple that will be here from our prayer team as well. And I wanna send you out with this thought. We go out from here as a people nourished by the living water of God's word. We go into a community of thirst. May the spring of life inside of us flow out so that others may find life as well. Have a great week.